author of the incredible book Breeze Frame, uh, which we're getting to. Two <laughs> and uh, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the Beyond the Scope podcast in this very special episode on set in the beautiful city of Miami. Um, we're not in the studio. Hopefully, this won't be uh, the first or last time uh, that you know, we we are filming on location. Right, uh, but there's a good reason for that. Uh, of course, uh, it is presented by NDMD Productions. We get the whole crew here uh, today of NDMD Productions, and today is sponsored by True Learn. But more about them later. I'm your host. Andy, senior year medical student, joined by today, Tyler Boschow, also senior year medical student. And an incredibly talented writer, author of the wonderful book, Freeze Frame, uh, which we will talk about in a second. Uh, soon to be pediatrician, as well as uh, the writer of the NDMD Productions blog. If you haven't followed the blog, uh, that, I mean, I can't say enough good things about the writing that you do and the resources um, that you make. So good to have you in front of the camera again. And I love this, man. It's been fun. It, it, it's good to have you here and having this very important conversation with our guest today, who um, barely needs any introduction. He is finishing up his psychiatry residency in yeah, the beautiful city of Miami, it's a mental health advocate speaker, creator, and now new author, drum roll, let's go. Welcome to the Beyond Scope podcast, Dr. Jake Goodman. Uh, How are you, man? I'm, in. I'm, I'm great. I'm really excited to get into it with y'all. It, it, yeah, can we just take a moment? I know I, I mentioned this at dinner, but like, how insane is it that like, the three of us are sitting in the same room right now? Like. It's incredible. And we'll definitely, we're going to get into it for sure. But there's like the, when we started talking yesterday and the amount of overlapping conversations of, you know, obviously our work together, y'all's work together, our work together too. Um, it's, it's just really like such an experience that all three are in the same room right now. A blessing for sure. Andy slid into my DMs four years ago, <laughs> three years ago. And um, it's been ever since then, we've been working together in some capacity. So thank you for sliding in. Thank you so much for the support those many, many years ago. Um, I mean, I was probably less than a thousand subscribers at that time. So it's it's been quite the journey uh, for both of us. And of course, like you just responding period means the world for smaller creators. And uh, I mean, look, look what it can do, the impact that you can have. And that's a, that's a conversation that we are definitely going to have um, over the next you know hour or so. And I'm so looking forward to it. I mean, when we talked about it yesterday, but when you had liked the or seen the music video at that yeah. time, we didn't even know people outside of like the city we were in were going to see it. And so that was huge. That was game changing for us. Like, oh, wow, people are listening to what we're doing or watching what we're doing. That music video was on another level. And that's something like as somebody that makes content, you can tell very quickly when something is done at that next level, when that extra time was spent with the sound and the, and the audio and the lights and the, and the color schemes and the, everything about that was on point. And I, I know we talked about the hundreds of hours that went into taking to filming that and producing that, editing that. Congratulations, guys. That was incredible. Nice. It, it, it was very much only the beginning. And uh, of course, the beginning of like really our, our friendship as well as y'all your first contact with us at all yeah i mean that really was the launching point for most of our i mean my work creatively i mean a lot of stuff with your channel that's what kind of why we're here right now i would feel i feel like without that yeah um so um but I, I think a big part of it too what that music video represents is a change in our perspective around mental health surrounding medical school and that's something we talked about a lot over dinner last night, it's something that I really want to dissect uh, today over this podcast. And who better to have the conversation with than our resident mental health expert, Dr. Jay Goodman. Let's do it. So just to kick things off, and I, I want to open the floor with just 
everyone's general opinion on mental health in medicine. And I know that is a loaded question. Mm -hmm. We have come a long way and we have a long way to go. We, to give some background information for those of you that are listening or watching that, that don't know about mental health in medical training, where we come from, I think it's important to talk about the roots of residency training, where this all started. And, um, Dr. Stuart Halstead is a name that you may or may not recognize, who was a surgeon who created the first residency program um, in John Hopkins University up in, in Baltimore. Um, and he, in his surgical program, he worked his residence long, beyond hours that we can even comprehend today. And the fact that residents are called residents is because they lived in the hospital. They were literally the hospital's residents, resided there. They were working upwards of 360 days a year, really no time off at all. They were discouraged from being married. They dedicated themselves 100% to the profession. It was found later on that Dr. William Stewart House said had an addiction to cocaine and was using cocaine to work long hours in the hospital. And he expected his residents to work those same hours. Uh, that was uncovered later, but at the at, by the time that it was uncovered, Residency trainings had sprung up all throughout the country based on the model that he created at Johns Hopkins. And uh, it, it was already too late at that point. The culture had really been started to work, 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 do not rest. And um, now over the last, you know, really like 10, 20 years, we've been doing a lot of work to try to improve that. The work hour restrictions were created, which is 80 hours a week, which is still a lot of hours and there's to improve there. But we have made great strides from where we were to where we are now. But we have a lot, a long way to go. It's certainly refreshing to hear as we're getting ready for residency. Yeah. But I just speaking from the med school experience, we're getting ready to uh, leave kind of the same process. I, I feel that we've made a lot of great changes from when I started medical school to where we are now. I, I feel really confident about a lot of changes we've made, but it's nowhere near where we uh, need to end, so we gotta keep it going. Definitely more hopeful uh, than I ever thought I would have been. Uh, we'll get into things like through, you know, a couple of years ago. Um, I'm I'm very hopeful for the the future of where it's headed. Yes, a hundred percent. Because Gen Z, the ones that would be the doctors of the future, they are more alert about what's going on in the mental health crisis in our country in general. And they're way more open to have these conversations. I find that they're through TikTok and other platforms where I engage with these people, they are the ones that are the most open to changing the culture. Mm -hmm. So I believe as they, I mean, I guess Gen Z will now just kind of be pre-meds at this time and maybe start to enter medical school very soon here. I mean, y'all are millennium? Technically, uh, I'm on like the, the weird border, but uh, yeah. um, I'm, I'm on the weird border too. I'm 99. So like I... I think I'm technically Gen Z, but I lived through like a millennial childhood. Yeah. So I understand the That's references true. of both. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, Gen Z will yeah. take it over here soon. And I have a lot of faith in it. That's fantastic. Um, I, I don't even know what would be the best place to start from there on in terms of like, you know, your experience with, speaking openly about this, of starting those conversations, that that's really where the change has come from, is that uh, whatever tangible change we've seen, it, it's really coming off the back of being able to have conversations. And we can't really track where the conversations go, but certainly when I started medical school, and I know you've talked about when you started, the ability to even start talking about it, that's, I feel like, has been the biggest change. And then, you know, I'd love to hear what's yeah. that's been the residency. When I was um, maybe a second or, yeah, I think it was a third year medical student, I remember a specific scene where I was driving, I was in a car driving to a wedding with uh, maybe four or five other medical students. We were all in the same class and um, we were going to a, a classmate's wedding. And I remember the conversation started about mental health. Um, someone was talking about antidepressants. And um, at that time I had struggled with mental health, but I had never sought any treatment for mental health. I'd never really received therapy or seen a psychiatrist or anything like that. I was very much 
uh, in my own head, quite literally about about mental health. Um, the person next to me started talking about the fact that he was on an antidepressant and and what his experience had been like. Then and then my friend in the back seat starts talking. Oh yeah, I also saw a psychiatrist and uh, I've been on this medication. And then the other person's like, yeah, I go to therapy and it's been really helpful. And I'm sitting in the car, currently anxious, thinking, why not me? All of them get to get help and get better. Why do I have to sit here in silence and and suffer in silence? Why? Right. Why? And that conversation kind of like unlocked something in my brain where I basically asked myself that question: Why? Why am I so hesitant to to reach out for help and like talk to somebody about what I'm going through? I I remember recording that story when I was filming like the behind the scenes of your TED talk and like. I mean, I did the same reaction I just did now of just nodding my head because I think like there, there's a sense of pride in medical school. I mean, we all work really, really hard to be here that it's tough. And like, there's this cultural sense of embarrassment to show any sign of quote unquote, awful use term weakness in right. the form of admitting that like, Hey, things are not okay right now. Um, and you know, the fact that you're presented in an environment where you, you can, you know, discuss with your med school peers who, you know, on the outside are all very, very successful and to open up like that, that conversation needs to happen with probably every single med student friend group in the entire country. And well, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, I know, I know, I certainly have not been able to, like, due to the length of, like, what you're doing, obviously, in mental health advocacy, but uh, in the last, you know, couple of years or so, with, since the book's launched, I, I've been able to go talk with a lot of uh, med schools, colleges, like, their pre-med groups, and I was curious to see, because I was kind of tracking, would I get into med school now? If I applied to the same exact application, how confident would I be? And I, I'm curious to see it. I don't know if I would. Um, I think that, you know, we, we do kind of push the, the bill on what we're asking for and whether that's right or wrong. I then was starting to try to think, well, I wonder the kind of problems that we're feeling as either residents or med students, how much of that is now in the pre-meds and how like we're going to keep pushing the bar lower. Um, you know, I'm, you know, obviously I'm very interested in mental health and kids, pediatrics, and you see things, what they're saying that I would never have thought to it what they're exposed to in that realm. Um, and it was, it was just interesting. They're, they're told for the most part from what I'm seeing from colleges and then like early pre-med, they're told a lot of the same things that I was told when I started that I've kind of come to see, I don't believe those are true, but it's the general opinion. And it's so-and-so says this, we all know this to be true. Well, who's specifically saying these things? Like you have to act this way. You have to approach medicine this way. But, and we all kind of hold it as law, but it's not tied to any specific person or doctrine, mm. kind of like a, like a hall set that you brought up. Yeah. It's just an accepted truth among the people trying to get to med school. Can you give an example? Um, so we talk about, you know, how many hours you're spending a day or, you know, sleep. Like if you sleep, if you get eight hours of sleep in med school or like the heavy pre-med time, you're pretty much told like, you're not giving it your full effort. I see. Yes. To stop. Yeah. Or even if like you're starting to feel anxious, depressed, I'm not even saying you're fully developing anxiety or depression, but when those start to develop, that is a normalcy of the process to get there that everyone has to go through. It's the kind of thing that college students accept. Like, yeah, I'm anxious, I'm depressed, but this is what it takes to get that level. Yeah, that I, I totally understand your point. And I remember in my somewhere in my training, I'm not going to call out who this person was or where this was, but I remember there was a, a talk that we had that somebody had asked because they were, uh, there was a lot of pressure on us to, to do research, um, extracurriculars, right. crush your, your tests and prepare for your board exams, whether that's the MCAT, USMLE, whatever. And I remember a, uh, physician to us said, um, you know, how much sleep are you getting? One thing, you, you know, you, if you're looking at your time management, getting like 
eight, nine hours of sleep, like that's too much. You need to be utilizing that time for research. And, and I remember being in the position I was at at the time and thinking to myself, yeah, he's right. Like I'm sleeping too much. Right. I think I was sleeping yeah. too. I was sleeping <laughs> seven, eight hours. How dare you? Yeah. And, and that's, and, and that, and it's not just, it's not like this person was evil and, and no, you know, yeah. that's a common thing. I hear, I, I, I'm on social media scrolling, you know, and it's like, here's how I went from 3.0 to 4.0 GPA college and got into every medical school ever. Number one, I wake up at 4.30 a.m. I work out, CrossFit. 5 a.m., I'm already studying. I'm doing Anki cards, 1,000 Anki cards before noon. And it's like, that's not sustainable. You were able to do that now and you're making this video about it. And maybe that's you, but that's not everybody here. That's never, that was never me. So I think it's really important to break those rules openly and talk about them. I'll say it. I sleep seven to eight hours a night. And uh, if I don't sleep seven to eight hours a night, my mental health suffers immensely. And, and I think one of the things is listen to the demographic that we're talking about. We're talking about like high schoolers and college kids that are, it's such a long, deep rooted mentality of this grind culture. And, you know, I know I brought up this quote by Dr. Laura Vader Potter uh, earlier, but I just want to emphasize it again that because it's something that I'm still like trying to retrain myself to think of is that we got to the positions that we're in because we think that rest is earned and not needed and like every, that's built from the ages that we're, we're talking about right now and when you talk about like the the trickle down of that um when i was going around doing the book tour i, I talked to a lot of uh apart from like colleges and that i talked to middle schoolers and high schoolers and what was cool is that i got to talk on two levels i could talk about writing and i could talk about healthcare and medicine if they were inspired for one or the other or both but it was it was so awesome to have those conversations and see what they were thinking. And I will never forget this one kid who came up to me. I think he was a freshman in high school. Um, and he came up to the, the booth uh, and said, hey, I you know saw your book. I saw you're in med school. I wanted to ask, um, like, what's your take on how much research I need published for med school? So I had nothing to do with the book. And I'm like, I'm here. If people see the book and they see med school and they want to talk about that, I'm all for it. Awesome. And I, I said, you know, I personally didn't engage in research in college and I've, I've engaged within med school to things that I want to pursue in, but it's not the end all be all necessity for, you know, any field. There are fields that definitely you need to engage in it more than others, but it's something you certainly don't need to be worrying about right now. Um, that's, you know, something to think about later and, but like, don't, don't stress about it. And he stopped with mid explanation. He goes, no, no, no. I already know, like where I'm going to college and I have like an end with that lab is set up. I'm talking in high school. How many papers do I need to publish? I only have one published right now. And he starts going on this big rant about how he's been trying to get the second paper published, but he's like, I don't get it published before high school ends. And I stopped him and I went, look, I, you know, this might be the wrong advice, but I would love if this weekend you drop everything that you had planned doing and went and sit by the water because it was around the, you know, Southeast world, sit by the water for like eight hours and just think like, do anything other than what you were already planning to get out of that. You know, it, it broke my heart. I, you know, I can't believe because I would never have thought that if I didn't publish X number of papers in high school, then something post-college wouldn't even be an option. There's, the, it, I used to be like that, not on that level, no. but I, for much of my life, was like productivity equals happiness. Productivity equals success equals happiness. Mm -hmm. They were all on the same plane. And I've had to train myself, and I'm still working on this. I'm nowhere near where I would like to be, to understand that it's okay and it's actually good to have moments where things aren't, there doesn't have to be a goal. Everything doesn't have to have a purpose. And I think there's a mentality amongst anybody, especially in medicine. I'm sure it exists in law as well. With, you know, I've talked to, to many lawyers and, and law students. I know it exists in that field and it exists in other fields too. You know, uh, private equity, like those people work, you know, investment bankers, stuff like that, right. where it's like you have to work 
harder than anybody else. And if you come in second place, it's last place because you won't get that opportunity mm -hmm. to go to the next level. And what I found over the years is um, I never, I didn't have to work that hard. I could have worked a little bit smarter. And that's been a, over the years, a process that I've learned is like, did I need to put in 13 hours a day study or would I have been able to get by on nine hours a day, making sure I uh, make sure I rest, make sure I get that extra sleep, make sure I exercise, do the things that I love to do, would I still have been able to do the nine? And when I've experimented a bit and be like, okay, this this block in medical school, I'm actually going to do only eight hours a day of studying instead of 12 or whatever it was that I was doing. And I found that my grades were quite similar. In fact, maybe even better. And that's been, a, it's really hard, you know, to give that kid some credit. It's really hard because everything he's been doing has probably been working up to that point. Got the research publication, you know, got a networking opportunity for someone from University of Blank Medical School. And it's like the harder you work, the more results you get from it. And that, that works for a time. Uh, but you, you can't do that indefinitely. You right. can't work that hard forever. Eventually, you're going to burn out. And that's something that if you're listening to this and we're pre-med, even prior to a pre-med, a pre-pre-med, a pre-med, a medical student, a resident, wherever you're at in your career, I think it's okay to slow down a bit. And that's the advice that I'm glad you gave him that advice. It's okay to slow down. You're still going to get to your destination. You might even get there faster if you slow down, which is kind of intuitive. Because if you keep up that pace, you might burn out and not make it. I'm so glad you threw out the word counterintuitive because in these talks I've been giving, I've kind of, I'm calling it the counterintuitive secret. Um, I, I've been asked a lot, like, how did you write a book in med school? I mean, for the most part, how do you just do med school as a thing? So how do you do that on top of it? And I tell them all that when I started med school, I cut out anything that had to do with writing art. I mean, I did a little bit of music, but the stuff that I really love that was time consuming. I cut that out because I was so afraid if I spent an hour on this and didn't spend that hour towards the dream that I had been going for, I, I might fail. And I was full of brain fog and I, I couldn't find a good study or retention plan. And I mean, we all struggle when we start med school, but when I started putting in writing again, the more time I was giving to it in a productive manner, I found the schedule that worked. You talk about working smarter, my study habits changed because I had to make time for writing. I had to think about studying differently. And because I did, I enjoyed the studying more. I retained it more. My grades shot up, the brain fog went away. I felt more energized. And I, what I'm telling the med students or pre that I've talked with is that it's counterintuitive, but when you have something on your heart, which everyone does outside of medicine, whether that's a relationship, a business, a hobby, whatever it may be, if you have something that is on your heart that you cannot separate from, when you give time to that, it makes more time for everything else in life. You yeah. find efficiency. I, I think we need to stop asking for and start doing and. Yeah. And that's what I've been telling a lot of medical students, especially as they're entering their like clerkship stage every day. I mean, we, we are in a field of delayed gratification. We are, I mean, that's what's preached yeah. at, ever yeah. since, you know, like it'll be worth it at, at the end. Like, at the end. At, yes, everything and all that end. And if you like, just don't worry about it. Suffer now, it'll be okay later. Yep. But like, like you said, it's so counterintuitive because, you know, uh, it, I've experimented with the same thing, um, both with, with media stuff. Um, yeah, I've experimented, same thing really with friendships relationships where like oh, we, we've all yeah. been all been trained to go like if there is something that is even remotely taking you away from whatever your career goals are cut it out it is a it is a leech on your time and your life which is just not true and and we know that that's be true but like we're taught it it's and an easy pitfall like oh my gosh photos like with relationships yeah um, i used to do that all the time yeah if there's any distraction from my dream, you're out of there. My dream above all else. And there's a way to do and not or, like you said. Uh, absolutely. And, and that's something that yeah, I, I tell every medical student coming through, like, do not neglect the other things going on. Yeah. 
don't convince yourself that it's a distraction. Let let it feed and nurture your career. Yeah. Um, and and like, I mean, thinking back on my time during, everybody has their step dedicated um, story, but mine for sure is like, I would, I would chop off like 10 points off that step D score if I could do so many things differently during that time, both for myself and the people around me. Yeah. There's, um, I, I, I'm in a similar boat. My, my story is more with the MCAT. Okay. A little dark here for a moment, but it's important that we have this talks. I had a friend in college who ended his life by suicide. And that was kind of the first time that I really saw how, how bad mental health can be if it's not treated. And I, this happened maybe two weeks before I'd taken the MCAT. And I didn't go to the funeral. I just said throughout the whole thing. And uh, I believed that any thing that would take me away from my dream was a distraction. And so I didn't go. And I never really grieved that loss. And, um, you know, this is over 10 years and I still regret it. So for those of you that are listening that uh, something like this will happen to you at some point, uh, maybe not on that level. I hope not on that level, but maybe somebody in your family will die. Yeah, a grandparent or a cousin or something like that, which is horrible. This does happen in life. And there's a culture of medicine that says, you're not taking a day off, keep getting there. You know, I wish I would have taken the day off. And uh, if you have an opportunity, you should take, my advice to you is you should take that day off. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, uh, along the realm of, not that you have to have a specific hobby, business, whatever, but whatever outside of medicine that moves you because you are a person and you do have a life and hobbies and interests and personality, hopefully, and all. I I think it, it it's it, we get lost in the fact that we feel like we can't take time for that stuff, even though what's something that all patients mostly cannot relate to? And that's medicine. Like most patients aren't in medicine, don't have a connection to medicine, but we as, you know, providers are supposed to connect with them and then, you know, a minute or less form a bond where they feel comfortable enough to share very personal information, but we're not investing in the qualities of life that would connect with them. You know, that's the uh, big, you know, I think that's a flaw in medical training all over the place is that we don't put more emphasis on these areas because those are actually the avenues that are going to get to better care. Those are the avenues that are going to create, maybe not the the textbook treatment plan, but the treatment plan they'll follow because they were willing to talk about. Um, I mean, so we're, we'll take a quick break in a second, but just now I really want to explore that idea because that gets into a lot of things that I've been asked on my residency interviews is how, how does the stuff you do outside media art make you a better physician and that's something that I, I think all of us um can speak to but yeah. i think before we continue i want to just take a quick break so we'll see you right back so i've said this before numerous times on this channel and i still stand by it practice tests and practice questions are by far the most efficient and powerful way to prepare for your standardized exams Something medical training is a disappointingly large amount of, as Jake, I'm sure you can attest to as well. Um, but in order to lighten the load and help you to excel on your tests, I am proud to partner with TrueLearn, the sponsor of this episode. TrueLearn is a data-driven test prep resource with a 100% pass rate trusted by top institutions such as Stanford, Mayo Clinic, Harvard, and much more. Their smart banks with questions written by content experts give you the tools to succeed on your crucial board exams. As a medical student, they offer prep for Comlex 1 through 3, USMLE 1 and Step 2 uh, CK, uh, and USMLE and COMAS shelf exams, all things that we've you know, conquered, which is nice <laughs> at this point. Uh, but it doesn't stop there. You have the same attention to detail and world-class practice test questions for PA, dental hygiene, MA, MP, nursing, OT, PT, speech therapy, pharmacy, and pharm tech licensing exams, just to name a few. For my residents, 
Jake? Yeah, the TrueLearn is cool because it actually has a, the TrueLearn Smart Bank has a, a partnership with Picmonic. When I use Picmonic, uh, I would not have scored as well as I did on step one in particular. I did use Picmonic to help me with these glycogen storage diseases and lysosomal, I mean, you know, McArdle's disease. These are like very unique, very hard to memorize things in medicine. And I remember Picmonic helped me out so much. And one of the cool things about TrueLearn is they have this partnership so that when you see a question in TrueLearn, you go to the answer bank and the answer choices and choose one and then you submit, you can scroll down and see the Picmonic video that's actually in embedded in the answer choices themselves. So you can actually, if you get that McArnold's question, you'll watch the McArnold's Picmonic video. That's one of my favorite things about TrueLearn. Absolutely. And they got it. A ton of amazing resources for me it'll be the um aba basic for anesthesia what's the in the like in training exam for peeps oh uh, i mean there's a i can't think of the acronym right now but it's certainly <laughs> <laughs> that exam sorry great bug <laughs> they, they got resources for all of it they have incredible uh, explanations with built-in resources uh, to really knock your exams out of the park. So if you would like to try TrueLearn, use code NDMD25 for $25 off your first subscription. Again, that's code NDMD25 for $25 off TrueLearn's incredible smart banks. Happy studying. Best of luck to everybody prepping for exams whenever you're watching or listening to this. And of course, thank you to TrueLearn for all your support on this podcast and this channel. All right, so of course, Actually, you know what? I want to start start us off by talking about how much the project um, Stay Inside means to us, and then I think what it taught both of us as far as what medicine is in media. Um, and so, Jake, you kind of mentioned it at the beginning, but oh, when that project was finally released the world we were just tagging people and sending it to like we we're emailing it to random people who were big you know on the platforms at the time what did you see from that video as far as impact um i saw the time that you guys put into it and anyone that puts that amount of time into something i thought okay this is this is big this is not just some video that they created to see what happens um the way that you brought in music and art into a, a video for a medical school was sort of groundbreaking. I hadn't really seen that before. We had, you know, when we were trying to tell people what we were doing, uh, I think it was hard to explain because people were thinking about those, um, not necessarily lip sync videos, but the parody videos that yeah. schools do, and they'll take a pop song and make it about studying and they're kind of cringe and, you know, um, and we, Definitely weren't trying to do that, but that was kind of what people had an idea. Oh, if you're in med school and you would make a music, music video, it's probably going to be that. So that was kind of a, a roadblock we had to start when we we're trying to express we want to make something very serious. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we went from there. <laughs> and, and just a refresher, if you guys haven't seen that uh, video, uh, Stay Inside is one of the earliest videos on my channel. And it, it was from the ground up, produced, directed, mm -hmm music and everything starring um three mcg students and the premise of that video was to bring to light some of the like emotional baggage that healthcare workers had during the covid pandemic um and it was dedicated to them so it wasn't a light topic at all no i mean insert i wish you to insert picture of ruche here yeah. um uh you know he's the real mastermind behind the music production of it but how it originally had developed was Roche and I were, we made, we wrote this song. It's loosely based off of like Runaway, Kanye, but we flipped the the message of, you know, he was very much calling out people in the industry and himself, but it was a very, you know, there's a lot of negative tones to that song, but it's a powerful song. The, the, the beat behind it's very powerful. And we liked the idea of well, what if instead of calling out what people are doing wrong, because that's what everyone's doing right now in COVID and you're like attacking people based on the, whatever beliefs or information they're coming from, it's all negative. Let's attack the people for what how they're living. What if instead we could call out the people that we see that are doing things right or trying to make solutions? Um, and we, I mean, the way we originally had thought about it, we were just gonna film on like photo booth on our MacBook. And like, we would we would have been fine with that um, 
before we met you just because that's what the, the song meant to us. Um, of course, then we meet you and they're like, oh, if we have the option to make this look a little more professional, what's the next thing we can do? What's Where else can we take this? And that's kind of every step of that project was what's something that we don't think we can do, but would be really fun uh, or groundbreaking or to make someone feel more than they could have before. And that's pretty much how the whole process worked. Yeah, and, and that feeling is something that really resonated with us when we start here and I was being played in schools, being played at, crazy cool. at the CDC as like a way to, to motivate people in a time where mental health was probably at an all-time low, particularly for healthcare workers. And I mean, honestly, us included. And this project, you know, it, there was a big impact on, on the people around us, but I think we found what really drove us in, in medical school uh, through that project as well. Yeah, I can say very selfishly that that project gave far more to me than I felt like it was giving the people. And I think it was giving a lot to other people, but I personally in that process, like refound a lot of myself and the things that I loved in medicine and out, like reassessing why I went to vet school in the first place. It became this very cathartic experience that completely shifted my view of what I want to do with my career moving forward and combining art and medicine. So that was like a, a huge pivot point in my life was that process. And I think between the two of us, we, we finally kind of got, I, I guess, some recognition, at, at least at, at MCG for the first time that like, yeah, they, these are these are not people running around with iPhones and just like, you know, trying to get some viral video off of nothing. These are artists who are trying to understand people through their medium and you know, that is something that has connected all of us. Jay, I would love to hear how your art has, you know, connected people and allowed you to reach many, many more than you will ever see in your office as, as a physician. Yeah, now that it's been for, I started in January of 2020, so we're approaching, I can't think it's already almost January of 2024. Approaching almost four years of posting content, I've made about a thousand videos, plus or minus, and we reached um, five hundred thousand over five hundred thousand people. You know, half of, I'm sorry, five hundred million. Wow, I'm sorry. Yes, that's very important distinction. <laughs> five hundred million or half a billion people have been reached through my videos talking about medicine and mental health. Yeah, I know. As I say that out loud, it doesn't. Very ironic. There's like there's a world map behind Andy's like looking, <laughs> and like how many people are in the world? Eight billion? Yeah, something like that. I mean, that's a lot of people that have been reached. And um, what I was talking to you guys earlier about is like how many lifetimes of being a physician would I need to live to see that many people? Probably a million lifetimes to see five hundred million people. I mean, truly. Uh, I, I couldn't do it in this life. So the way that I've been able to reach all these people by making videos that are engaging, that talk about problems that exist and solutions that we can utilize in medicine to improve the culture. It's also a way for me to cope with everything that I've gone through in medical school and that I've seen my peers, medical school and residency and everything in between, and I've seen my peers experience as well. 24 hour shifts, night shifts, social isolation, depression, anxiety, you know, one in nine medical students experience thoughts of ending their lives. You know, why don't we talk about that more? I make videos about that. I make videos about people, um, you know, what it's like getting help as a, as a medical professional. What's it like going to a therapist or going to a psychiatrist? I've shared my own story personally, as I believe that sharing my story can help so many people that are in medicine and outside of medicine. And it's been truly one of the biggest blessings of my life to be able to have this platform and to still utilize this platform to do everything from write a, a, a book for kids about mental health to create a video about 
24 hour shifts and the dangers that occur with that to give a TED talk about how we can improve residency to being invited to the White House to to talk to the vice president. That was the top two coolest moments of <laughs> life. I say top two. Also, my wedding was pretty dope. Uh, that was wedding was number one. Ari, if you're listening to this, wedding is number one. Mary A.D. was number one. Meeting with the vice president was definitely number two. <laughs> Just to clear that up. Um, honestly, I, I'm curious to know, you, you talked about the content in your videos. How how many people do you think like you reach where your video is their only, at first, a probably only source of psychiatric education yeah uh i have i have a whole album in my phone a photo album of all the screenshots that people have sent me things like no one has ever talked about you know social anxiety disorder before i never heard of it until i saw your video uh i did some research and i'm actually seeing a doctor for the first time to talk about this with them Thank you for for giving me the uh, the push I needed or the education to go and take this first step. Um, I have many people that are in medical school or in residency that say I wouldn't have reached out to see a a doctor or a therapist if it wasn't for you, because what is so important in medicine is a representation. You were saying at dinner the other day that some people message you and say, "I've never seen someone that looks like you." in the profession that I want to pursue. You know, I didn't know that you could be depressed, have a have a depressive episode, experience depression, and be a doctor. I didn't know that when I was younger. I didn't know that you could have bipolar disorder and be the Surgeon General of California. The last Surgeon General of California openly had bipolar disorder. So, and had sought treatment and had living an amazing life and interviewed me for her podcast. She's amazing. Um, my point is you don't know you can do it until you see it. You don't know that, you know, whether it's a black president or a, a doctor with bipolar disorder, you don't know that you can do it until you see it. So these kids and young people that are watching this and being like, they did it. I could do it. That's the point. And that is a prescription no one can write. Like, and, and that's why, you know, these podcasts, the seven question interviews mean so much to me because, yeah, like, like you said, Dr. Uh, Agachuku from the orthopedic uh, surgeon interview, seeing the comments of like, finally, like somebody that looks like me is, is giving me the motivation to take the MCAT for a third time apply for the second, third cycle in a row, or even freshman in high school, I have no idea what I want to do with my life. That's it. Because I see myself in that, like you said, representation matters. And that's, that is medicine in, in itself. There's media medicine. I'm sure that's going to be somewhere in the title of this video. <laughs> uh, did I say media medicine or medicine media? Both. Y'all like know forever, where I mean. forever intertwined <laughs> yeah. now. Um, yeah. I, I do like what you said about uh, you know, I, I, uh, something is not possible or it's not in our kind of lexicon until it is, until it happens. Um, whether that's representation or you doing some, you know, avenue that other people haven't done. Um, I think that really is the crux of a lot of problems, which I want to get into with kind of wellness. I want to talk about wellness. And I want to talk about advocacy, not just, you know, us advocating for our patients, other people, but how do we advocate for ourselves in training? Um, I think a lot of the pushback that we see, you know, nationally on progress in these areas is because X, Y, Z has never happened before. So we're not going to start doing it now. And it's, it's kind of that fear of the unknown. Um, you know, I, I certainly did not think that writing a fiction book was going to have any real like impact. I did that. That book came out of what I was seeing around COVID with, children and med students, you know, around medicine, but specifically, I know I'm interested in, in children's mental health and what all these conversations they're saying, you know, my mom's a, a high school teacher. So I'd like to hear also from her and what they were dealing with. You know, you see what you see in clinic too. At this time, we have the peak developmental years where they're completely isolated. And a lot of their concerns are 
share, but they just don't know that they're all sharing the same problem. And it's not like you can open the doors and play and have them all talk to each other, but that's where art and media, that's, that's its place in medicine is the conversations that you can't have in medicine. That's where there's room for this. Um, and like, I know I, I've talked about this before, but I, when I started doing some of the like meeting readers and seeing like, I'm curious to know what they think of the book and all, I never would have expected some of the responses of, there was one girl who came up to me at the booth and she was bringing her mom along with her. And this book does deal with loss and tragedy and how you move on from that. And she, the first thing she says is, you know, I lost my dad last year. We don't talk about them anymore at home. And this, like reading through this and all, this very much feels like my experience. And um, afterwards, like we saw, we had a nice little moment. It's really awesome. And, and what the mom said after was like, I've never heard her talk that way. I didn't know she wanted to talk about it. We kind of walked on the eggshells around it. And that's where I realized, oh, there's an avenue for, I guess me specifically for writing um, to accurately depict what you know, within children's and young adult media in that, you know, population, what are they really going through? What do they feel others, you know, perceive they're going through and then opening it up both to like help them feel represented and having like the larger scale, you know, adults or whoever it may be see, oh, this is, this is what they think about. Like, this is what their day to day is. I don't know that I've never. Thought I would cry in the Barnes and Noble, but I definitely cried in the Barnes and Noble after <laughs> that talk, man. <laughs> I think that representation component comes in. It doesn't have to be representation in, you know, what you see on social media or in real life. It can be represented in a book. That that girl may not have had anybody that she knew that had lost a father or lost somebody in their family, but she's reading a book that talks about it. And that is now a, an avenue for her to pursue those feelings. That's the beautiful thing about art and whether it's a movie, a book, or a, you know, a video that's created, it, there's a sense of shared experience, even though Will, the main character of the freeze frame, isn't a real person. He is as, you still get that same level of shared experience, even he's, though he's not right in front of you. Right. He's here in this book and you get to explore him and his loss. It's putting into words indescribable feelings. Like that, that is what art is, you know, whether that be visual, writing, even audio, like music. That, that's why music is so powerful and connects the world because it evokes emotion no matter what language you speak. And, and that, and there, it, there's such, such beauty in that. And, you know, you talk about, you, you do something and it opens up the opportunity for like when we have conversations about mental health it opens up the door for other people to have conversations about mental health when we do things that may be atypical within medicine it opens up the door for others to do you know unique ways of, of treating people um i had a conversation with uh, a doctor the other day where they said i just wanted you to know my daughter she's 11 um she wants to be a pediatrician and she wants to be a children's and young adult author but she's told like around school, it's like you had to pick one. And she's already being told at 11. And me as like a doctor, I can educate her on the medical side of things, but I don't know the realm of writing. And so I don't know what to tell her that. She said, I can't wait to tell her that there's someone trying to do that. Um, and I like, it's, 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 it's small moments like that. Like you, you know, you certainly opened up the door on the social media side of things for people to just express their own mental state, their opinions on things. It opens up the conversation in ways that you can't really predict. And yep. And not the word. Um, okay, but getting back to like wellness. I want to talk about wellness in medical school and in residency. Um most of my talks that have been around these uh, and there is even like they have different terms for wellness in colleges, um, but it's still wellness from place to place. Um, most of like the questions I get asked about are their qualms with the way wellness wellness is handled there. So what's like generally our take on how wellness has changed since the last couple of years, where it's heading? 
specifically in medicine. In medicine. Um, I think people are slowly starting to realize pizza parties don't really work hot, you know, grades created at five. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, and, you know, uh, I'm starting to see the acknowledgement of wellness days. Um, of course, there is the whole thing with wellness lectures and modules, which just aren't, aren't effective. No. They're, they're not. We're doctors. We know what to do for our body. We know we need sleep and balanced meals and fruit and vegetables and social interactions. We know that. We don't need another wellness module. We need time and space to rest and sleep and see our families and live our lives outside of the hospital so that when we come back to the hospital, we're the best version of ourselves. But if you have a wellness module, you can put that into Anki carts and then you can get states for petition. Please don't give them any ideas. <laughs> no. You're absolutely right. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, this is something that I I don't think um, a lot of institutions understand. And it's something that everybody working there in the trenches do understand, is that we need more time away from work. We are working so hard when we were at work. We're giving it our all. We are sacrificing so much of ourselves physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. We are time away from our families. We are investing for in residencies set 60, 70, 80, 90 hours a week, sometimes more. Sacrificing and giving our all to our patients. We need more time for sleep and rest. It, it is not a sustainable model, one that exists right now. And when you I have heard many a stories of people coming off a 28 hour shift, which by the way is legal and accepted. Coming off a 28 hour shift, right into a wellness module, made into a wellness one hour module lecture. It's telling about that the importance of sleep. We don't need another wellness module, we need time and space for rest and sleep. So what's the, what's the answer? Is, is the best solution that you just have extra time of free space, like just free time. Is that the best model? Like I know, you know, you see a lot of programs that I, I do enjoy some of the group wellness stuff they do. And when they listen to whether it's their med students or their residents about things that they would like to do, you know, if there's room in the budget to have some kind of event that they all would like to do together, you know, that's, that's nice. And I think that there's avenues for that, but it's the best model free space, free time. If I had all the power, yeah. you know, here's what I would do. Uh, number one, I would form a whole committee to talk about this thing so it wouldn't just be me making the decisions. But knowing what I know now, I would... Uh, this is my pitch for becoming the ACG and being president. Here we go. Uh, huh. Number one, on, on day one in office, I would eliminate 24-hour shifts entirely. We have so much data that supports how, uh, how detrimental those shifts are to resident doctors and patients due to increased medical errors that occur people are working 20, 22, 24 hours straight. When our bodies are up and moving and thinking, and you know, we are doing complex things like saving human beings' lives, our brains are on. And when you've been working for 24 hours straight, your physiological reaction in your body, this is you know directly from the CDC website, uh, we have about the same reaction time as someone that has a blood alcohol content of 0.1, which, as a reminder, 0.08 is the legal limit to drive below 0.08. We are operating on, quite literally, a human being or treating somebody in a state of physiological drunkenness. That occurred when people work for over 24 hours straight. Number one, I would ban 24-hour shifts. I would increase um, the ability, and this is if I had unlimited resources, of course. I would increase the ability to hire people at night and pay them 1.5 or two times what someone during the day would make um, to, to work night shifts so that the resident doctor isn't required to work from 8 a.m. to 8 to 8 a.m. to 8 a.m. 8 a.m. Monday to 8 a.m. the next day. Um, I would increase drastically the number of slots available for medical school and residency. 
right now there's a mismatch uh, between there's a supply demand mismatch where there are more medical student graduates than there are residency positions. That's wrong for many reasons. You shouldn't sacrifice so much of your life to get to medical school, work so hard for four years to graduate and not match in the residency. That's wrong. Um, so we need more resident doctors that are, and this this is happening actually. There's been an expansion of residency slots over the last couple of years. Slow. I mean, it maybe it was a hundred slots or something like that. Yeah, we're not nearly near where we need to be, but we're at least adding to it. Right. We are moving in the right direction. So I would increase the number of residency slots. Um, I would also have a zero tolerance policy when it comes to retaliation, humiliation, and mistreatment in the hierarchy between uh, attendings and, and residents, residents and medical students. No public humiliation, no harassment, no fear of retaliation. That really uh, creates this culture where people are afraid to speak out and say what's what's going on. Those are just some of the few that I would say off the top of my head. Man, now you said running for the candidacy of it, I think that's a pretty good pitch. <laughs> Vote for Jay Goodman for 2029, ACGME president. Flip okay. out here for sure. <laughs> You heard it here first. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, all those points, I completely agree. I, on the med school side of things, I, on the med school side of things, is obviously like we're about to go through the match system and everything, and like it blew my parents' minds that somebody can work for four. Like it just, it didn't compute to them that somebody can work for four years and just not have a job after med school. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's like a real thing and it's not even an uncommon thing and that's terrifying so you know no one in my family is in healthcare um and i live with my grandfather his best uh role model um an absolute bro but i can't tell you one of my favorite hobbies now is sitting down and re-explaining the match process trying to you know it's just you can't fathom that the, the way that the system works and every time we get close to it he says something eloquent to the the extent of why hasn't someone changed that, that process? And I was like, well, you know, it's the system that we're in right now and we got we got to make best what it is. But it is funny when outsiders of medicine hear about it. Yeah. Um, like he always says to me, Wait, Tyler, do you want to go work there after med school? Why don't you go interview there and uh, see if they're hiring? I was like, I'd love to, man. That'd, that'd be great. That, that's the transfer. It's like the, the people are like, what if you if you don't like the place where can't you just like leave and, <laughs> and, and, and i was like like you're hilarious you think i could just like pick up and leave either, either that or they're like dude don't worry about it you can negotiate everything i'm like negotiate <laughs> that's great yeah like like you really think we get to do that you actually hold all the power as an intern it's a <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. The, if anybody can explain to me why we as a field decided a sorority match was like yeah. the best way to decide our career, I I would love to know. Let's just give a quick like 45 second synopsis of what the match is. Yeah. I don't really know. When you finish medical, before you finish medical school, you uh, apply to a bunch of uh, different residency programs and they interview you. It's on Zoom. It's a whole thing now. Um, when you are ready to submit your match list, you create a list of all the programs that you really like. And they also create a list of all the applicants that they really like. And it's it's in order. So if University of A is better, in your opinion, than University of B, and you put University of A as number one, you better hope that they also put you in the top of their list. Then this giant algorithm starts crunching all these numbers. And somehow it takes months. Uh, it actually probably takes minutes, but there's like all these fact checking that goes into it. And you wait and you hope and you pray that your favorite program ranked you. And then on March the 9th, 10th this year, it's. Hold on. Yeah, it's really, on. the second Friday. Early in oh, yeah. March, you, you wait around. Everyone, every school does a little bit different. March 15th. March 15th. March 15th. Yep. Yeah. You, you wait for this email to come at noon. And heads up, guys, it might actually come at like 11 to 36, and it did for me. And then you hit enter, and you look to see whether you've gone and matched at the place that you want to go to. And maybe it's nowhere that you ever wanted to match at all. And uh, you have to be okay with that. Wait, 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 you're forgetting that 
it's a week before that. Oh, you, yeah. You, best part. You get an email of whether you match or not, period. Yes. And even if you did match, they're like, well, can you tell me where so I can prepare to, you know, look for a place to live, work that out? It's like, no, 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 no. Wait a week. You gotta have will tell you. You gotta have bit day, man. You gotta you gotta open the envelopes. If you have been in a sorority, not I've not been in a sorority, but if you have been in a sorority in your life, you understand the match more than ninety nine percent. One hundred percent. The thing is, many schools will put you on stage. Oh my gosh. And they'll say, All right, open the email, uh, or like open your letter. And then you're up there with maybe your partner, but you couples match was the conversation for a different day. You mm -hmm. tie your applications together and you're like, University of, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and you really didn't want to go there and you have to fake it. And everyone's watching. Sometimes they're recording you. <laughs> Live streamed it. So yeah, uh, honestly, how I at least envision um, ortho uh, residency match to go is I swear they just sit in a room and like flash our pictures up uh, on the wall and they just look around the room and it's like, all right, is this guy chill or not? And then it's like a big thumbs up or thumbs down. <laughs> and then it's just like, hey, eh, he died. Um, and then that's just, that's how they figure, I don't know. It, it's, it's a really archaic system. That's the best way to describe it. And yeah, I don't know why we decided um, this is the best way to do it, but honestly, it's a source of a lot of uh, anxiety and mental health issues in med school. Yeah. Like I like I mentioned, uh, going unmatched is unfortunately just like common commonplace, and that, as that should not be the case, um, especially if we're gonna tout all around that there's a physician shortage out there. Yeah, and and for those listening that uh, are you know hear that and like oh my god, like unmatched like. It's not the end of the world. I know so many people that have succeeded in unbelievable ways that have matched in their dream program that didn't match the first year. It happens. I know I know many, I mean many, I can think of more than 10 people I know that didn't match in the specialty that they wanted, uh, didn't match in the residency that they wanted, or didn't match at all, and ended up having to go uh, again the next year. There, there are systems in place to make sure that you will be able to accomplish your dreams. You are going to be able to match at some point, maybe it's not your first year. So if that does happen to you, um, it's not the end of the world. It, it sucks and take your time to be angry and upset and sad and cry and whatever you need to do, but it's not the end of the world. It, you, got, you had said it earlier too, that in medicine, it's really common for us to stay result oriented um, and not be process oriented. And if you know, I, I would never tell anyone how to feel about not matching or not matching where they want to be. But, you know, it is this process of medicine. Like if you are in medicine for the right reasons, like you're in it for life. If it is a part of who you are, it is a job. You should have a life outside of that, but it is a part of who you are. And so if that happens to you, it is part of your process and it's not the end of your process. I love that. Very much, uh, very much true. I just wish like, that, that didn't happen in, in the first place. Uh, I really believe that one, you're, you'll end up where exactly where you need to be at the end of it all. But two, like everybody who gets through medical school deserves to have a job as a doctor. Agreed. And so, you know, and tying that back into the conversation we were having before about what causes a lot of anxiety and stress and towards the end of med school around that is we are getting in a day and age where we're having less um, parameters or less like criteria for people to be able to review objectively. Like, you know, we don't have step one anymore. No, that, could be in it. that could be an episode in itself. I know. But like, so a lot of med students do ask all the time, well, if we only have these couple things, a lot of med schools are pass fail now. So we don't have like objective grades and all. Um, what, what can we do to better our chances? And I, I do feel that there's a, severe lack of communication between what med schools as a whole i've heard like that tell their students and what residencies may actually be looking for there's not really a lot of communication going on those which no wonder that would cause a lot of stress and anxiety about the whole process sure and i i actually would advise people to um because i i was in the culture where step one really mattered step two really mattered everything mattered yeah we were ranked everything mattered um, I would take this opportunity 
to think to yourself, how can I make myself unique and distinct and stand out from the pack while doing something I love? If, yes. I'm going to repeat that because I think it's really important. Is there a way to separate yourself from the pack and make yourself distinct and unique while doing something you love? If you're listening to this or watching this and you think of an answer in your head right now, go do that thing while you're in medical school at pre-med because that can make you unique. And what is that thing? That thing could be you run marathons. That could be you knit sweaters. You uh, brew kombucha. You know, that thing is what sets you apart. And as somebody that has been on the receiving end of interviews and on the other end, as someone that has interviewed people, I know for a fact that people remember those things. Oh yeah, that's the marathon guy. Oh, that's the YouTuber. He makes cool YouTube videos. Like it, it's that thing that makes you unique and, and it doesn't have to be this huge, you don't have to start a nonprofit. If you did, that would be dope. But if your thing is brewing kombucha, make it part of you and talk about it in your interviews and, and um, you know, obviously still do whatever you need to do, whether it's uh, pass your boards, do your research if you need to, et cetera, but also have that other thing that separates you from the pack. And that, that's perfect the way you describe that because at a couple of these schools, I tried doing this little section of the talk where people would pull out what's something that you do and it cannot have anything related to the medicine, just shout it out. It's really cool seeing what people do. And then I ask what, at this given moment in time, what are you interested in medicine? What possible field that can change? And then we started brainstorming how could you possibly connect them? Not that you have to. You never have to make your, you can keep those worlds separate if it's precious to you. I, I absolutely encourage that. But if there are ways that, you know, you can combine, that can be not only an asset for interviews, but that can be an asset for your career, for your future. Um, there was a, in my, my old class, she's a uh, neurologist or uh, PGY1 in neurology now. She was a painter. And after we started doing a lot of this art stuff, make, making it more herbal, she showed me this like hidden um, painting garage in her apartment that she hadn't showed anybody, but she was making all these paintings of the same image, but slightly different each time of how you would view the image if you had that neurological deficit. And she's like, because because sometimes you can't really describe to somebody who doesn't have this, like what their world looks like. And now here's frame by frame what it is. I was like, I'd love to put that in the waiting rooms. I don't really know if people would care about that. That is beautiful. So it's not that you have to do something like that, but mm -hmm. I got chills here and I thought that was so unique. Sweet. And you also, if you're hearing this and you're like, damn, I don't have that thing yet. That's okay. I, uh, I didn't even think or imagine in a million years I would be doing what I'm doing on social media when I was a third year medical student. No idea. Did the best I could. I worked hard. I played soccer. I guess that would be my thing. Um, these things can come up in your life later organically and just follow your passion, what makes you happy and gives you energy. I discovered social media that became one of my passions at age 26 or 27, whatever it was. So be patient if you haven't found that thing yet. And in the, uh, the emphasis of not needing to feel like you have to mix them together, you know, at the end of the day, you are applying for a job and they want to be with people that they enjoy sitting around the hospital with. That, that, that's a huge part of this. Um, and so like someone I know when they were interviewing, didn't think it would be prudent to bring up they love Dungeons and Dragons, but they, they, they do really love Dungeons and Dragons. And they brought it up on their interview and unbeknownst to them, that program was actually, they had a campaign that was running for years. And that ended up being the crux of their interview talking about like, oh, if you came, you could be in our campaign. So you never know if you are more vocal about those things, that might be the connection that a program was for. It would be a good fit. Very cool. So, I mean, like, shout out Carter, but like in, in another, yeah, example, yeah. I mean, he is like a ranked apex player. Um, yeah, it's like a battle royale, like big, big game. He's on like an esports team and everything. And I literally received a text this morning going like, dude, why do half my interviews ask about that? He's a med student? Yeah. He, he's, a, he's applying for anesthesia as well. And, and what I have to tell a lot of people um, for these interviews too is like, the fact that they reached out to interview you means that they already think that academically and clinically you are competent. Yes. 
the interview is figuring out if I was stuck on a night shift with you, would we still be able to get along and have a good time? And, and that's all about just like character, conversation, and experience. The vibes, man. Yeah, the vibes. Yeah, <laughs> the vibes, basically. And what what gives you those vibes? It's not, it's not books. It's not lectures. It's living life. Right. And not the word. Exactly. And so that's why you know, we've talked about it a lot over the past like hour or so at this stuff, media, writing, hobbies, you know, that, that little thing of that, the thing that you want to combine medicine is goes so far in developing you as a person. Um, and ultimately a physician it's, yeah, circling back to what you said too. They, patients don't talk in biochemical pathways or farm, farm kinetics. They speak in stories. They speak in experiences. And the way to connect with patients is bringing to the table your own. Love that. Um, so as we kind of wrap up, um, I, I hate to do this round robin style, but I, I I think like each of us have our own little pieces of advice to give to, you know, the medical student or um, college student right now who's, who's going through these stressful times and maybe they're on the verge like you and I in first year of med school of like dropping a lot of our creative stuff. Like what's that one little phrase of advice to kind of end this and, and leave, leave them with, um, Tyler, uh, sorry, I'll put you No, no, it's fine. I, I mean. There's so much I could say. I I do think if I could tell myself anything differently and really like flip back the clock, I really wish I would have been more honest with myself about why I'm doing medicine and what I want out of it and all. I certainly went into medicine for the right reasons. And the second you start, it's really easy to lose, lose sight of that initial mindset. Um, and I... I wish I would have been more comfortable exploring the, the person of Tyler outside of the med student of Tyler, because when well, we said it a hundred times today, that, that I have found more success talking with patients or when our team talks with patients, when we make it as personal as possible, if we have any shot of connecting with a stranger, it has to, we have to find common ground and medicine's probably not going to be that common ground. Um, and so I just. I wish I would have felt more comfortable being outward and exploring that stuff earlier um, because it's been like, I've gotten the most beautiful memories out of it. And I think it's shaping how I'm going to be a physician, being able to help someone in the clinic in every way I can. And then in the ways that I can't, this fills the gap. I agree. And my, so parting wisdom would be um, to take time to slow down. It's okay to slow down a little bit. Um, you don't have to full stop, but you could slow the train down a little bit. It doesn't have to be going 90 miles an hour right now where you're at in life. Um, you're still going to reach your destination, and you'll probably be more happy when you reach that destination when you're able to breathe a little bit more and have some time to slow down because life moves pretty quick. Um, and regarding when I bring up destination, that's another thing I want to talk about because we all have this in medicine, it's a rampant. I'll be happy. We did video about this. Mm -hmm. I'll be happy when I take the MCAT. I'll be happy when I get accepted in medical school. I'll finally be happy when I take my boarding exam. Finally be happy when I'm matching the residency. As somebody that's done all of those steps, the happiness is not waiting. You might feel it a little bit for a day or two, but it's not, if you aren't happy in your life, that is not right around the corner. That's a fallacy. It's not real. It's not real happiness. If you can find happiness in the journey and what you're doing right now, as you're listening to this, as you're walking to class or you're preparing for to wind down for the night or whatever it is you're doing, if you can find happiness right now in what you're doing, you are winning life and that is so difficult to do and it's something i work on every single day that because that i'll be happy when never goes away 
But now it's like, I'll be happy when I finish residency. I'll be happy when I start my private practice. I'll be happy when I pay off my medical school debt. I'll be happy when I get my next home. It's always there. It's always there. It's never going to go away. If you could understand that that exists and find happiness right now in what you're doing, you are winning. And and that's my advice to you is recognize that it's there and do your best to try to enjoy the journey. Just just a stack up on that, my would be kind of a way to to help think of just that destination side. Uh, for me, it's just prioritize people and experiences uh, over anything else. Um, I, I'm just... I'm so thankful for these past couple years that the platform and just the nature of the videos that I make has brought so many people and experiences into my life. Um, so thankful for you guys sitting here, uh, supporting my family and friends. Um, but looking back these past few years, that's what I cherish. Not, not the hour slap in the space bar. Not, not, you know, the grade, the past, like, you know, sign for the step scores or anything like that. It's the stories that I have to tell from all these past years. And that's irreplaceable. That's, that's what makes people smile in those 10 minutes I get with my patients in pre-op area before they undergo this scare procedure. If I can bring my experiences to the table to help calm their nerves and assure them that they, they are safe and heard, I'll do it. So, yeah, thank you so much, Jake and Tyler, for, you know, we just had sit down and have this conversation. This is beyond my wildest dreams, seriously. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. This has been an absolute pleasure, man. I love this. Well, so, uh, if you haven't, uh, please... Follow uh, Jake and Tyler uh, across the socials. Um, there should be a blog post coming out very soon, written by yours truly over here. Um, Detailing more deeper stories of Dr. Jake Goodman. And uh, until then, we will see you in the next one. Um, also, this is going out on New Year's Eve. So happy 2024, everybody. So wish you all a Merry New Year and happy holidays. Thank you. Happy New Year's, everybody.